We're going through lecture 20 today, uh, design strategies. We'll be going through a, an end-to-end -end example uh, of, kind of full uh, process synthesis, right? We're, so we're gonna be building a uh, constant time counter. Uh, we'll start by kind of giving it a CHP description and then uh, transforming that description in various ways uh, step by step to get it to make kind of simple implementable pipeline stages and then we'll be taking those pipeline stages uh, you know the CHP descriptions of those pipeline stages and uh, walking through a full implementation procedure in you know down to production rules so uh, today's lecture gets us down to a, a dynamic single assignment uh, CHP specification of a single pipeline stage of the counter. And then uh, on Monday, we will be doing the uh, production rule synthesis of that specification. So our goal, build a counter that signals whether or not it's empty, right? So, and we want it to do this in constant time, right? So when you uh, first start a problem like this, uh, you want to make sure that you entirely understand the uh, the behavior of your inputs and outputs, kind of what you expect uh, data patterns to look like. And then you want to ask how uh, we might be able to take advantage of those behavioral patterns uh, to get average case performance instead of worst case. And this question is the most important question when building a self-time circuit because uh, you inherently have a 2x area overhead as a result of your delay and sensitive encodings. You, your pipeline is inherently slower, um, and it, it, if you're doing, if you're operating on uh, large swaths of data, it can also take more energy, right? Because uh, every single, uh, every single bit that you send also uh, communicates validity information alongside that bit, right? And that takes more energy. And so this question, you don't have a good answer for this question, then quite straightforward, you shouldn't be using quasi-delay and sensitive circuits. Um, at the very least, you should be using uh, bundled data. Or if, uh, it, you know, if it's bad enough that you can't use bundled data, then use synchronous, right? And it turns out that, uh, you can generally manipulate your problem to get it uh, so that your worst case and average case are close enough that synchronous is almost always preferable. Now, it is also always, just about always possible to manipulate your problem to create uh, kind of an extra average case behavior that is far more performant. It is just a difficult thing to do, right? Possible, but difficult. Uh, and so for a counter, it, it's pretty straightforward, right? So if you measure uh, all of the increment and decrement operations in the spec 2006 benchmark, right? You measure every single execution of that and you look at the carry chain length, right? Uh, for that increment or decrement. And you add up, you know, add up all of the occurrences of that. You'll get a distribution that looks like this, and it's basically just a logarithmic, um, you know, an exponential decay uh, all the way down to about 16 bits. And uh, most of that is covered by zero, one, or two bits, right, in carry chain, which means that generally you don't want to uh, have to interact with the vast majority of your counter, right? And synchronous counters uh, often end up clocking the entire counter, right? They, they have a clock that uh, is not gated for the rest of the counter. Now there are asynchronous counters that, uh, that, you know, basically don't operate on a clock, but that are used often in clocked systems. Um, and this is the reason why, right? And so for a, for a counter, a lot of the time, synchronous systems are able to get away with using a synchronous or an asynchronous counter. Um, 
because you can make it constant time. Um, and in this case, uh, we'll be using we'll be showing a quasi delay insensitive constant time counter. All right. So, basic description of the counter is shown above. Uh, we first initialize the value in our counter to zero. Then we send uh, the status of the counter, whether or not it's empty, uh, down LZ, and then receive the next command from LC. If the command is increment, then we increment the value of our uh, counter. And if the, if the command is decrement, then we decrement the value of our counter, right? So it's, um, it's a pretty straightforward definition of the counter. Uh, and then we can kind of look at what that behavior might look like um, in a, a very simple simulation, right? So we start with, uh, so we have LC on the left here and we have LZ on the right. And we start with LZ sending uh, a zero flag, right? So the counter is empty. Uh, the internal value of the counter is zero. And so the first command that we get is increment. Uh, and then uh, that sets the value of the counter to one and we return not zero uh, down the uh, LZ channel, right? Then we increment it again, our counter goes up to two. Uh, we return not zero down the um, uh, status channel, right, LZ. We can decrement, we get not zero again, we decrement, that brings us down to zero, and we send zero back down the LZ channel. So that's the behavior we're looking to implement. Is there a neutral command where it just idles and doesn't increment or decrement in this design? So the, the neutral command is you just don't send a command, right? So this is self-timed, okay. which means that you it can just sit there and wait while there isn't a command. Okay. If you're asking about like, probe the status of the channel without changing its value. Um, it turns out that we don't need that. And uh, I'll show you why. Uh, but that's, we'll, we'll get to that probably near, near the middle of this lecture. So our next step, once we've characterized the problem is we want to break it down, right? Uh, and we use process decomposition, we use projection to do this, and we want to make sure to take advantage of our average case behavior. Uh, and it's very important that we do this, right? First, we have to answer whether or not we can, and then we have to make sure that we do. Okay, so here's our uh, our counter, right? And we want to break break out the least significant bit. Right, so we've given ourselves some space in the specification here. And we're going to take this internal uh, counter memory value, right? And we're going to break it out into the LSB followed by all the rest of the bits, right? And so we have V representing the least significant bit, and then we have VN representing the remaining bits. And so in the beginning, we initialize both V and VN to zero. Uh, when we send down LZ, we send V is equal to zero and VN is equal to zero. And then when we increment, if V is already zero, right, if V is zero, then we just need to set V as V to one, right? So we don't carry that increment command up into the rest of VN. And that's what allows us to take advantage of our uh, behavior, right, of our average case performance. Then if V is one, we set V to zero and we propagate that increment to the rest of the counter, right? Vn equals Vn plus one. For decrement, if V is zero, we set V to one and we propagate the decrement out to the rest of the counter. And if V is one, we set V to zero and we do not propagate, right? So now for uh, actually more than half of the increment or decrement commands, uh, we, we only interact with the LSB, with the least significant bit. And the reason I say more than half is because statistically, if you go back and look at the distribution, uh, we generally increment, decrement, increment, decrement. We don't, we don't get past that first bit often. Okay. Um, so now we need to 
start breaking this process into two, right? We wanna pull this process out uh, into one that covers the uh, least significant bit and then one that covers the remaining bits, right? And so the first step in doing that is uh, communicating our all of our interactions with VN right, over a channel, right? Basically separating those interactions uh, with a channel in between. And so uh, I've highlighted all of our interactions with VN, and we're just gonna stick channel communication actions uh, in between that, right? And so for, uh, for initialization, uh, we have uh, on one side, we set V to zero, and then in parallel, we set VN to zero and send a status down RZ, which says VN is zero. Uh, then we receive that status from RZ on on the on this side. We now have RZ telling us whether or not VN is zero, right? Uh, and so we use that in our expression for LZ, which we then send uh, out of our process. Then when we increment and V is one, we set V to zero. And then we send a command, the increment command, down RC, and then wait for the status from RZ, right? And in parallel, we are waiting for the command from RC, incrementing VN, because we know it's an increment in this case, uh, and then sending the current status back through RZ, right? Uh, so if you've ever, ever programmed in Go, we've effectively, effectively created a Go routine uh, that does like three actions and then, and then remerges, right? Okay, so for the decrement, then when V is zero, we set V to one, we send a decrement down RC, we wait for RZ, and then in parallel, we wait for the command on RC, we decrement VN because we know it's a decrement, we just sent it. Uh, and then we send the current status of VN down RZ. So the next step is to separate out the two processes. Now, we've done a pretty good job here of uh, keeping uh, our interactions with VN separate from our interactions with the rest of the circuit. So we can now highlight, right, all of the things that belong to the LSB are in blue, and all of the things that belong to the remaining bits are in red. And so we can actually you know, use projection to just split these apart into separate processes. And so you know, previously we had, if you look, we had VN equals zero, RZ send VN equal to zero. That just goes straight into the initialization of the other process, right? We had uh, RC receive RC, uh, VN uh, you know, increment VN and then send down RZ. That ends up here. Uh, in the condition for increment, right? Wait for the command from RC. If it's increment, increment VN, and then send the status, right? And the same thing for the decrement. Now you'll notice that this process spec is identical to the one that we started with, right? And so this transformation, basically we, should, we can just re recursively do this transformation over and over and over again. And so now this is what our counter looks like, right? We have individual bits with processes communicating to each other over uh, uh, the command channel and the zero channel, right, Z. And so if we increment, uh, that uh, raises the value of our first counter to one and then sends not zero. We increment again, and that sets the value of our first counter to zero forwards the increment command forwards not zero on our status uh, because we know that uh, this is an increment, it's going to be not zero on the return. And then uh, sets one in our counter above, we get not zero here uh, and we receive the not zero on RZ, right? So these values are RZ right, the, the internal variable that we've got here. And here and here. Okay, then we send not zero back down the counter. 
Uh, and we, so we're executing another increment in parallel here, right? Increment along with this not zero flag. So that increments this, and then we send not zero down here. Uh, then we uh, receive a decrement. So right now the value of our, our counter is uh, two, or sorry, three, right? We started with zero, we did one, we did two. Um, zero, one, two, three, decrement, two, right, not zero, decrement, and we're in this in-between stage, right? So we go back down to one. This, everything above here is zero, so now this forwards zero down the status, and um, that sets our RZ variable, internal memory, in the uh, first bit. And then we execute another decrement in parallel, and we get zero as a status on the output. OK. So then we want to simplify this specification a bit, right? This is the thing that we want to synthesize because uh, the rest of the counter construction is just repeating this over and over and over again. And so our first step is to take this conditional statement and these conditional statements and flatten them, basically combine them together. Um, and so now we get, uh, if, if it's an increment and v is zero, then we set v to one. If it's an increment and v is one, then we set v to zero and send out rc, wait for rz, right? Uh, same thing for decrement. All right. So our next step is to flatten this out into uh, a dynamic single assignment CHP specification, uh, optimize it uh, pre-implementation, right? Basically do everything that we can to uh, decide, make design decisions uh, before we create production rules. And so uh, we need to think about the environment of just this process, right? Uh, what are its possible input values? What are its possible output values? And then what, are, what values does it need to store? Uh, what are some common interactions between all three of those things, right? How can we tie together the encodings of those three in ways that those common inter interactions line up in, in our event space, right? Um, so that the common interactions have cheaper encodings overall, right? Uh, and then when is our internal memory switching and when is it stable? Because that uh, determines what we can do with our internal memory uh, with respect to our four drivers and uh, or our input enable. Then we wanna pick uh, our communication protocols for our input and output channels and the communication protocol for our internal memory. Right, because uh, there are other internal memories than just the uh, NLATCH, and uh, those will be presented in the next lecture. We also want to pick encodings for our input requests, our output requests, and all of our stored states. Uh, maybe having uh, a one of two for our uh, counter value and a one of two for our above counter state is not a good idea. Right? Maybe we want to uh, combine those in some way. And then we want to take all of these things, right? use our knowledge of common interactions, and group all of these common interactions into uh, much cheaper encodings, right? event encodings. Now, it's easy to say all of this. It's much harder to do all of this. Um, I can tell you that the counter design uh, actually took me three months to do, right? And that's just three months of design space exploration, of repeating this over and over and over again, right? I, I go through this process, try a particular organization of all of these encodings, uh, come up with a design, go back to the beginning, try the process again to come up with a different organization using what I've learned before, right? Um, and so this is very much an iterative process. And the final bit of uh, the of recommendation that I can give is any time that you can, 
take complexity of the, of the process that you're building and push it out to the environment, right? Because as, as long as you keep doing that, uh, as long as you can keep doing that, then you're kind of good to go. Um, keep in mind that doing so is a greedy algorithm and can get you into trouble sometimes, right? Sometimes it's not always good to push complexity out to the environment. In general, it seems to work out. All right. So where is complexity in this so far? We have two channels uh, talking, to, talking to our process on the left, and we have two channels talking to our process on the right. And they seem to kind of coincide, right? Those two channels seem to co coincide with each other. We always have a send followed by a receive, or we always, always have a receive followed by a send. And so that sounds very much like an exchange channel. Right, that we covered in the last lecture. And so we need to rework this process a bit in order to implement that exchange channel, right? And so if we recall uh, our positive exchange channel, right, on the request we have valid data in, that's our command. And then on the enable, uh, when the enable goes high, we have valid data out. And so that's gonna be our status information. Right, so do the, execute the increment or decrement, and then figure out the status and send it back to the to the user. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, step one is we look at R, right, the uh, right hand channel. So right now we we take R C, we send the command down R C, and then we receive the the status on R Z, right, and that's fine. We have one caveat, which is the reset here, right? And so instead of doing a full receive on the reset, we're gonna use a probe, a data probe. And so because, if we go back to here, because valid data, right? Because data is valid when E is high and because E is reset high, that means we're gonna have valid data for the status on reset. Right, um, and that'll tell us that the rest of the counter is zero. Then we just do we just execute our um, exchange channel, right? Send the increment, receive, uh, and then we use the probe again, right? Instead of receiving into some internal variable, we just use the probe. Okay. So then we need to do the same thing for our left-hand side so that we can then tie these together, right? Except we are kind of running into a problem. For the left-hand side, we first send the status and then we receive the command, which is not great because we actually wanna receive the command first, right? And so we need to do some kind of loop rolling here, right? We need to take this uh, command on LC and we need to roll it over to the end of the loop, right? And we need to take this command on LZ and we need to do the same, right? So let's roll this command on LC through the loop uh, and uh, use probes here rather than our LC internal variable, right? So that's step one, right? So if the, co the command waiting on the channel LC is increment, then we do the increment and we receive the value from LC, right? Uh, if it's increment and V is one, we do the increment, we propagate the increment, and only then do we receive the value from LC. All right, so then we need to deal with this LZ channel. And again, we're gonna roll this around to the other side of the loop but we're also gonna need to pull one out of the loop, right, to do that rolling, right? So first we send zero on LC, then we move the, the rest of the sends on LZ down to the end of the loop, right? So receive on LZ, LC and then send V is equal to zero and the probe on R is zero. Cool, so now we can take our LC channel and we can turn it into an exchange channel, right? 
And so this becomes basically setting our input enable, right, to, to the zero value. And then this becomes a receive on, an, on a positive exchange channel. Uh, with the enable uh, send being our zero check, right? And so we've successfully converted the specification over to an exchange channel specification. The next problem is the overflow condition, right? We want to create a constant time counter. And right now we are forwarding our request on R, and then we have to wait for that increment request to propagate all the way down the carry chain, and then the status to propagate all the way back to the carry chain for us to then send the status out L, right? So I'll show you that here. We have our overflow condition, right? We send an increment, that increment propagates, that increment propagates again, and then it propagates again, eventually we get zero on our status flag, which then has to propagate and propagate until we get to the end, right? And so that's no longer, that's not constant time, right? That's linear time with respect to the length of the counter. Um, now, when our counter overflows, that's not exactly a desirable outcome either way. And so because it's an edge case, if we just decide never to use it, then we can kind of sacrifice that overflow condition uh, for constant time behavior. So instead, we keep some internal memory of the previous status, right? Of our previous uh, propagated command. And we're going to encode that in a one of three alongside our data bit. Right, so now our counter is either zero or one, or it's zero and the rest of the counter is zero. Right? Um, and so Z represents zero and the rest of the counter is zero. Zero represents just this bit is zero. Uh, and then one represents just this bit is one, right? And so we've turned, instead of checking whether or not uh, V is zero, we check to see whether or not it's not one, right? Because either Z or zero should result in V switching to one. Uh, and instead of uh, using this probe on the channel, on the receive side, uh, we, we just check to see whether our internal memory is equal to Z, right? And instead of, and then when we uh, decrement and V is one, right? Then instead of just setting V to zero blindly, we check to see what the probe on RZ is, right? And if the probe on RZ is uh, zero, right? If, if the right-hand side is zero, then we set V to Z. And if the probe on the right-hand side is not zero, then we set V to zero. Right, and we can do that. We can get away with that because uh, in steady state, when R is not being used, we have data on the enable wires. Okay, so what does that look like now for the overflow condition? Well, unfortunately, when we increment and V is one, we just set V to zero, right? We don't set V to Z. We don't know how, right? We don't have any information to tell us how. And so we increment, that increment propagates, but now we immediately respond with not zero. And that continues to propagate up the channel, right? Up the counter. And so this has the added side effect of kind of increasing the capacity of the counter by about two thirds oddly enough, um, because if we were to decrement now, we would not be decrementing a zero case, we'd be decrementing an overflow case, right? Okay, 
And so we can now flatten this specification out a bit. Uh, and that's where we're going to leave off for this lecture. Right? So now we have a specification that we can take through synthesis entirely, right, on the production rule side. It is dynamic single assignment. So we, we only ever assign V uh, once per cycle, right? We only ever send on R at most once per cycle, and we only ever send or receive on L at most once per cycle. And so you can kind of see that these conditions should lead directly to your forward drivers, right? And so now we're going to switch in the next lecture, we're going to switch away from formal synthesis, which is what we've been using so far. And we're going to switch into templated synthesis in order to do to build this by hand. Now, if we had Haystack fully constructed and up and running, then we could run this through Haystack and get a synthesis on the output, right? Using formal synthesis. But we don't have that yet. The, the single most important takeaway here is you have to find those average case behaviors and you have to take advantage of them, right? Um, otherwise, there's really, unless you're dealing with like extreme environmental conditions where you're seeing a huge amount of delay variation, you shouldn't be using uh, QDI, right? Either take advantage of average case or you need robustness.